job number 00360-8M-0635. The President addressing the Congress following the Egyptian-Israeli summit conference at Camp David, recorded Monday, September 18, 1978, at 8 p.m. in the House Chambers. Vice President Mondale, Speaker O'Neill, distinguished members of the United States Congress, justices of the Supreme Court, other leaders of our great nation, ladies and gentlemen. It's been more than 2,000 years since there was peace between Egypt and a free Jewish nation. If our present expectations are realized, this year we shall see such peace again. First thing I would like to do is to give tribute to the two men who made this impossible dream now become a real possibility. The two great leaders with whom I have met for the last two weeks at Camp David. First, President Anwar Sadat of Egypt. And the other, of course, is Prime Minister Menachem Begin of the Nation of Israel. I know that all of you would agree that these are two men of great personal courage, representing nations of peoples who are deeply grateful to them for the achievement which they have realized. And I am personally grateful to them for what, what they have done. At Camp David, we sought a peace that is no not only of, of vital importance to their own two nations, 
but to all the people of the Middle East, to all the people of the United States, and indeed to all the world as well. The world prayed for the success of our efforts, and I am glad to announce to you that these prayers have been answered. I've come to discuss with you tonight what these two leaders have accomplished and what this means to all of us. The United States has had no choice but to be deeply concerned about the Middle East and to try to use our influence and our efforts to advance the cause of peace. For the last 30 years, through four wars, the people of this troubled region have paid a terrible price in suffering and division and hatred and bloodshed. No two nations have suffered more than Egypt and Israel. But the dangers and the cost of conflicts in this region for our own nation have been great as well. We have long-standing friendships among the nations there and the peoples of the region. And we have profound moral commitments which are deeply rooted in our values as a people. The strategic location of these countries and the resources that they possess mean that events in the Middle East directly affect people everywhere. We and our friends could not be indifferent if a hostile power were to establish domination there. In few areas of the world is there a greater risk that a local conflict could spread among other nations adjacent to them and then perhaps erupt into a tragic confrontation between us superpowers ourselves. Our people have come to understand that unfamiliar names like Sinai, Aqaba, Sharm el-Sheikh, Ras en Nakab, Gaza, the West Bank of Jordan, can have a direct and immediate bearing on our own well-being as a nation and our hope for a peaceful world. That is why we in the United States cannot afford to be idle bystanders. Why we have been full partners in the search for peace and why it is so vital to our nation that these meetings at Camp David have been a success. Through the long years of conflict, four main issues have divided the parties involved. One is the nature of peace. For the peace will simply mean that the guns are silenced, that the bombs no longer fall, that the tanks cease to roll, or whether it will mean that the nations of the Middle East can deal with us, with each other, as neighbors and as equals and as friends with a full range of diplomatic and cultural and economic and human relations between them. That's been the basic question. The Camp David Agreement has defined such relationships, I'm glad to announce to you, between Israel and Egypt. The second main issue is providing for the security of all parties involved, including, of course, our friends, the Israelis, so that none of them need fear, attack, or military threats from one another. When implemented, the Camp David Agreement, I'm glad to announce to you, will provide for such mutual security. Third is a question of agreement on secure and recognized boundaries. The end of 
military occupation and the granting of self-government, or else the return to other nations of territories which have been occupied by Israel since the 1967 conflict. The Camp David Agreement, I'm glad to announce to you, provides for the realization of all these goals. And finally, there is the painful human question of the fate of the Palestinians who live or who have lived in these disputed regions. The Camp David Agreement guarantees that the Palestinian people may participate in the resolution of the Palestinian problem in all its aspects, a commitment that Israel has made in writing and which is supported and appreciated I'm sure by all the world. Over the last 18 months, there has been, of course, some progress on these issues. Egypt and Israel came close to agreeing about the first issue, the nature of peace. They then saw that the second and third issues, that is withdrawal and security, were intimately connected, closely entwined, but fundamental divisions still remained in other areas about the fate of the Palestinians, the future of the West Bank and Gaza, and the future of Israeli settlements in occupied Arab territories. We all remember the hopes for peace that were inspired by President Sadat's initiative, that great and historic visit to Jerusalem last November that thrilled the world and by the warm and genuine personal response of Prime Minister Begin and the Israeli people and by the mutual promise between them, publicly made, that there would be no more war. These hopes were sustained when Prime Minister Begin reciprocated by visiting Ismail Air on Christmas Day. That progress continued, but at a slower and slower pace through the early part of the year. And by early summer, the negotiations had come to a standstill once again. It was this stalemate and the prospect for an even worse future that prompted me to invite both President Sadat and Prime Minister Begin to join me at Camp David. They accepted, as you know, instantly, without delay, without preconditions, without consultation even between them. It's impossible to overstate the courage of these two men or the foresight they have cho shown only through high ideals, through compromises of words and not principles, and through a willingness to look deep into the human heart and to understand the problems and hopes and dreams of one another can progress in a difficult situation like this ever be made. That's what these men and their wise and diligent advisors who are here with us tonight have done during the last 13 days. <laughs> when this conference began, I said, that the prospects for success were remote. Enormous barriers of ancient history and nationalism and suspicion would have to be overcome if we were to meet our objectives. But President Sadat and Prime Minister Begin have overcome these barriers, exceeded our fondest expectations, and have signed two agreements that hold out the possibility of resolving issues that history had taught us could not be resolved. The first of these documents is entitled A Framework for Peace in the Middle East Agreed at Camp David. It deals with a comprehensive settlement, comprehensive settlement between Israel and all her neighbors, as well as a difficult question of the Palestinian people and the future, the West Bank and the Gaza area. The agreement provides a basis 
for the resolution of issues involving the West Bank and Gaza during the next five years. It outlines a process of change which is in keeping with Arab hope while also carefully respecting Israel's vital security. The Israeli military government over these areas will be withdrawn and will be re replaced with a self-government of the Palestinians who live there. And Israel has committed that this government will have full autonomy. Prime Minister Begin several, said to me several times, not partial autonomy, but full autonomy. <laughs> Israeli forces will be withdrawn and redeployed into specified locations to protect Israel's security. The Palestinians will further participate in determining their own future through talks in which their own elected representatives, the inhabitants of the West Bank and Gaza, will negotiate with Egypt and Israel and Jordan to determine the final status of the West Bank and Gaza. Israel has agreed, has committed themselves, that the legitimate rights of the Palestinian people will be recognized. After the signing of this framework last night and during the negotiations concerning the establishment of the Palestinian self-government, no new Israeli settlements will be established in this area. The future settlement issue will be decided among the negotiating parties. The final status of the West Bank and Gaza will be decided before the end of the five-year transitional period during which the Palestinian Arabs will have their own government. As part of a negotiation which will produce a peace treaty between Israel and Jordan, specifying borders, withdrawal, all those very crucial issues. These negotiations will be based on all the provisions and the principles of Security Council Resolution 242, with which you all are so familiar. The agreement on the final status of these areas will then be submitted to a vote by the representatives of the inhabitants of the West Bank and Gaza. And they will have the right for the first time in their history, the Palestinian people, to decide how they will govern themselves permanently. We also believe, of course, all of us, that there should be a just settlement of the problems of displaced persons and refugees, which takes into account appropriate United Nations resolution. Finally, this document also outlines a variety of security arrangements to reinforce peace between Israel and her neighbors. This is indeed a comprehensive and fair framework for peace in the Middle East, and I'm glad to report this to you. Between Egypt and Israel. It returns to Egypt its full exercise of sovereignty over the Sinai Peninsula and establishes several security zones, recognizing carefully that sovereignty right for the protection of all parties. It also provides that Egypt will extend full diplomatic recognition to Israel at the time the Israelis complete an interim withdrawal from most of the Sinai, which will take place between three months and nine months after the conclusion of the peace treaty. <laughs> and the peace treaty is to be fully negotiated and signed no later than three months from last night.
I think I should also report that Prime Minister Begin and President Sadat have already challenged each other to conclude the treaty even earlier. And I hope they <laughs> make it soon. This final conclusion of a peace treaty will be completed late in December, and it would be a wonderful Christmas present for the world. <laughs> final and complete withdrawal of all Israeli forces will take place between two and three years following the conclusion of the peace treaty. While both parties are in total agreement on all the goals that I have just described to you. There is one issue on which agreement has not yet been reached. Egypt states that agreement to remove the Israeli settlement from Egyptian territory is a prerequisite to a peace treaty. Israel says that the issue of the Israeli settlements should be resolved during the peace negotiations themselves. Now, within two weeks, with each member of the Knesset or the Israeli parliament acting as individuals not constrained by party loyalty, the Knesset will decide on the issue of the settlements. Our own government's position, my own personal position, is well known on this issue and has been consistent. It is my strong hope, my prayer, that the question of Israeli settlement on Egyptian territory will not be the final obstacle to peace. None of us should underestimate the historic importance of what has already been done. This is the first time that an Arab and an Israeli leader have signed a comprehensive framework for peace. It contains the seeds of a time when the Middle East, with all its vast potential, may be a land of human richness and fulfillment, rather than a land of bitterness and continued conflict. No region on the world, in the world, has greater natural and human resources than this one. And nowhere have they been more heavily weighed down by intense hatred and frequent war, these agreements hold out the real possibility that this burden might finally be lifted. But we must also not forget the magnitude of the obstacles that still remain. The summit exceeded our highest expectation. Well, we know that it left many difficult issues which are still to be resolved. These issues will require careful negotiation in the months to come. The Egyptian and Israeli people must recognize the tangible benefits that peace will bring and support the decisions their leaders have made so that a secure and a peaceful future can be achieved for them. The American public, you and I, must also offer our full support to those who have made decisions that are difficult and those who have very difficult decisions still to make. What lies ahead for all of us is to recognize the statesmanship that President Sadat and Prime Minister Begin have shown and to invite others in that region to follow their example. I have already last night invited the other leaders of the Arab world to help sustain progress toward a comprehensive peace. We must also join in an effort to bring an end to the conflict and the terrible suffering in Lebanon. This is a subject that... <laughs> this is a subject that President Sadat discussed with me many times while I was in Camp David with him. And the first time that the three of us met together. This was a subject of heated discussion. On the way to Washington last night in a helicopter, we mutually committed ourselves to join with other nations 
with the Lebanese people themselves, all factions, with President Sarkis, with Syria and Saudi Arabia, perhaps the European countries like France, to try to move toward a resolution of the problem in Lebanon, which is so vital to us and to the poor people in Lebanon who have suffered so much. We will want to consult on this matter and on these documents and their meaning with all of the leaders, particularly the Arab leaders. And I'm pleased to say to you tonight that just a few minutes ago, King Hussein of Jordan and King Khalid of Saudi Arabia, perhaps other leaders later, but these two have already agreed to receive Secretary Vance, who will be leaving tomorrow, to explain to them the terms of the Camp David Agreement. We hope to secure their support for the realization of the new hopes and dreams of the people of the Middle East. This is an important mission, and this responsibility, I can tell you, based on my last two weeks with him, could not possibly rest on the shoulders of a more able and dedicated and competent man than Secretary Cyrus Vance. Finally, let me say that for many years, the Middle East has been a textbook for pessimism, a demonstration that diplomatic ingenuity was no match for intractable human conflict. Today, we are privileged to see the chance for one of the sometimes rare, bright moments in human history, a chance that may offer the way to peace. We have a chance for peace because these two brave leaders found within themselves the willingness to work together to seek these lasting peace, these lasting prospects for peace, which we all want so badly. And for that, I hope that you will share my prayer of thanks in my hope that the promise of this moment shall be fully realized. The prayers at Camp David were the same as those of the shepherd King David, who prayed in the 85th Psalm, Wilt thou not revive us again, that thy people may rejoice in thee? I will hear what God the Lord will speak, for he will speak peace unto his people and unto his saints but let them not return again unto folly. And I would like to say, as a Christian, to these two friends of mine, the words of Jesus, blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be the children of God. <laughs>